real precious. The the larger one is um Sally Provost, the granddaughter. Oh, it says live. Well, yeah, good I think we're live now. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Oki, uh, Senatapi, Nistu Nidaniko, Makoyo Sakoyi. I am part of the board and uh, consultant for training uh, with the Native Wellness Institute. And I'd like to um, introduce our special guest today. Um, this is a, a young woman that her and I have been working diligently with healing and intervention of missing and murdered Indigenous women um, on the Canadian side and now on the United States side. We're gonna just we're gonna have a conversation with you. Um, so uh, Anita, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about you because some people might not have met you yet. Or so, I know a lot love you and care for you, but we're just like, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, hi everyone. My name is Anita Lucchese. I'm really excited to join this conversation with Theta and Native Wellness Institute today. Um, I am a Cheyenne descendant and I am executive director of Sovereign Bodies Institute. We are a nonprofit research center focused on gender and sexual violence against indigenous peoples. We're a little different from most research centers in that we're staffed by um, indigenous survivors and MMIW family members. So it's personal to all of us. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm joining from Northern California today on Weot territory, uh, where our main office is based. And um, I got into this work as a survivor of domestic violence and rape and trafficking. Um, so it's personal to me too, because I almost was one of these women. Uh, we have some connection issues today. So if you see Theta drop out for a little, little bit, it's just because of her her connection issue and she'll pop on in just a second. Um, so I'm gonna keep introducing myself while we wait for Theta to join. Um, so like I said, uh, I came to work on MMIW as a survivor when I escaped trafficking about five years ago. Um, I was uh, called to create a database of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And you can see some of the names from the database behind Theta. Um, she's got her board there of all of the cases that have happened in the Blackfoot Confederacy. And kind of how Theta and I connected for the first time. I was working on my PhD at the University of Lethbridge, which is on Blackfoot territory in southern Alberta. And um, Theta and I met up in Lethbridge and um, started talking about what we can do for MMIW together. And it's been a great couple of years since. So glad to join the conversation with her today. Well, thank you, Anita. And as you can see, um, I just see Anita as some of our 20-something up upcoming geniuses. i just like to, you know, Anita and I connected um, because we're both survivors. Um, I was uh, groomed and sexually abused by a medicine man in uh, South Dakota and have done significant healing on it and that's part of what we want to share is the healing. Um, as you can see, it's not something that I cry about. Um, I've done significant healing and forgiveness and letting go, but we want to share some of that insight of how we get to that place and actually um, say prayers for my abuser because he's still alive and perpetrating other women. So, um, Anita, let's uh, let's start. We're really excited. Oh, my God. Today is like a beautiful day because we have a toolkit. And this is something that all of you can access. And it's because all of the communities, all of the tribes. and Well, we lost Theta for just a second. But the toolkit she's talking about um, is from Sovereign Bodies Institute. It will be on our social media and website today. Um, our graphic designer is doing last final touches and then it'll be out. Um, but as Nita was mentioning, it's it's going to be free for download on our website. So it's something for everybody to access. Nita, did you want to add a bit more on the toolkit? Um, I just would like all of our, whoever's, you know, listening and whoever's watching this, it's, uh, it's kind of like a GONA toolkit. Um, the way that it's been put together and the way that Anita and the staff and the graphics, it, what it has is the best thinking of grandmas and the best thinking of millennials put together 
and it's kind of like a, a magic piece because it should it has um activities it has questions it has um stuff you can read and then you tailor it to your culture to your area and you start um doing all the activities of healing and intervention coming from your tribal point of view we're really not trying to you know make everybody um Lakota or Navajo or Diné or uh, we're, we're really trying to help people um, self-actualize and develop what works for their people. Um, Anita, do you want to um, tell us how, where you see us in, in 2020, how you, uh, you see us doing healing with missing and murdered indigenous girls? Hi, Anita. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, the idea behind the toolkit is. Um... Yes, can you hear yes, me? Yes, I can. Theta? Okay, yes. good. <laughs> um, okay, we're really hoping that um, it will help anybody who's wondering how to get involved in the MMIW movement or what they can do to help or um, to participate. Um, we all have different gifts we all have different callings and um, the movement needs all of that so the toolkit has a whole bunch of different chapters um, like on building awareness or fundraising or support services for families um, gathering your own data uh, working on policy initiatives no matter what uh, your point of entry is section for you Hi, Anita. I'm just going to um, continue on um, talking. I wanted to start with um, sharing with you some of the healing movement that I see happen for um, Native women um, over the years. And I'm going to share a couple of resources with you in addition to the, the toolkit. But, you know, one of the, the realizations um, is that, um, and it's something to do with around uh, an ACE score, adverse child effects. You know, any one of you can take this, this um, ACE uh, assessment. And it's, it's actually um, 10 questions in which you can um, answer and you adverse child effects. So a lot of times when we're um, doing our healing, it's good to know what that score is. Because um, if you have like a score of zero or one, then you know um, that you're, you haven't experienced a lot of what we would call Indian trauma, Indian trauma growing up. And it's the stuff that you experience from the time you're born till you're about 18 years old. And, but if you have a score, like my, my score is 10. Um, the predictability is that, you know, I should have drank myself to death or um, committed suicide or, got killed or beat up or something. I'm 64 years old and I have 32 years um, continuous sobriety and I've been working on my codependency for about 50 years now. And so I, I just say that because I've been working with women who it really to do an assessment um, to um, with safe people, you know, either could be 12 step or Uh-oh, we lost her. She'll be back in just a second. In the meantime, while we're... Oh, there you go. Okay. You're back. With, um, with our sisters is really doing... Um, it's like an inventory. You know, what were the times in your life in which you were felt isolated? You felt scared? You felt um, like nobody cared? And you felt like you didn't matter? So when you do that type of assessment, we have to start saying, well, what is my resilience? What's my protective factors? Who are my safe people? Who are my safety nets? Who are my, my best friends that I can tell everything to and they don't judge me? 
and they actually just listen. Like one of the best safety nets that you can have is to have friends who listen to you totally aren't doing other things and just listen to your heart. And when they listen to you, they don't advise you. They just say, I'm here. I'm glad you got that out. And so I'd like to just, you know, start to encourage our, our women and our men. If our men out there, if you love a woman who has had trauma, just remember that and remember that you, you have to um, reassure us that you have to um, symbolically, you, your action is what we see. They're just like little small things. I mean, you know, like one of the things, and I always tell this, you know, we, we have social media, but sending special, write a letter, write a love letter, write a love text instead of, you know, write, write something that you're bearing your heart to that woman. Um, make her a gift, send her a gift. You know, there's all kinds of different ways of expressing love. Um, Anita and I, we 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 talk all the time. Um, you know, I'm on her board of directors for. Yeah, Theta's on our board for SBI. Uh, she's one of our founding board members. We're really lucky to have her um, advising and guiding SBI. And so. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I apologize for the shape shifting. I, I um, once in a while turn into a wolf <laughs> and so That's why you see me disappear. It has to do with, you know, in a rural, rural Montana, our Wi-Fi is intermittent. So we're still going to continue the conversation. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple ways that um, I've been doing my healing. And then maybe, Anita, you could point out uh, a couple things. You know, one of the things that I've been doing um, most recently is just being out on the land. You know, I learned very early that, you know, my protective factors and my resiliency factors, because I suffer from something, and I'm just going to show you a book. Um, this book is called um, The Perfect Daughter Syndrome, and it's a book that um, I've been working with for over 20 years now, just working the guides inside on my healing. And what I've had to do is because I'm an oldest child, um, my father was an alcoholic. Um, he's no longer on this earth, but there in the early part before he stopped drinking, there was a lot of um, terror in our family around. And it wasn't my dad. My dad was a, a beautiful, gifted uh, Blackfoot man, but he had the disease of alcoholism. And so uh, very young, you know, when, when we're young and we see someone who hurts us, we want to hurt them. And we that's what happens later on in our lives is, is that we want to play that scenario over and over. So we'll engage in relationships where we hurt them, we play games, they hurt us, we play games. And so what I have, this book has helped me. She'll be back in just one second, guys. Hold on. I'll just say that it, it has helped me um, in my healing. And then um, another thing I wanted to share, and this has to do with our Native men. Without, And I say this because of all of the men. It's called something called the silent sun syndrome. Um, you know, often the, the big silent type um, they, they can't say they love you. They can't um, find the words. There is, this is actually the healing um, for native men. And I'm just sh pointing this out because a lot of times we're, we're both in this, if we're a heterosexual couple, we're both in this for healing. If we're a two-spirited or LGBTQ couple, same thing. We need to do some of this healing as adult children of alcohol. Um, so, um, well, during this pandemic, okay, now this is this is some of the stuff that I'm doing. I'm relearning to make cooking a ceremony. I'm relearning that all of I actually light a smudge while I'm cooking. It, it makes me fearful right now because I thank all of even if it's a vegetable, I thank it for its life. If it's I love, I'm a meat eater. I thank that meat for its life. 
I, as I'm putting the ingredients in, I'm thanking it for the nourishment. So one of the things that time is I really make eating and food a ceremony and that it's sacred. That actually sitting down you know, with the family that I do get to be around and that we, ha we have a ceremony of eating together and appreciating our food. And I have a spirit plate. I make a, you know, little bites for the spirits and I put out and ask the ancestors to help us during this pandemic and to help us and to Anita, why don't you tell us something about how you're <laughs> feeling yourself and we'll okay. go there for a moment. <laughs> Um, well, there's a couple stories that I wanted to share today. Um, I think Theta has brought up such a good point about the power of healing relationships, whether it's romantic or with your family or your friends. Um, that's definitely a big part of my healing journey was I was always looking for healing in romantic relationships. And that's not always, um, you want to find somebody who's committed to supporting your healing, but isn't trying to heal you for you, if that makes sense. Um, and that was something I had to kind of learn the hard way. And one of the things that I really struggled with um, in the last couple months is at the end of 2019, um, I, I was just going through a really hard time um, and was really burnt out. And um, I ended up uh, testifying against the Keystone XL pipeline as a survivor of trafficking. And I put my story on the public record. And that was the first time I'd ever done that. And it was so hard to do. Um, and it was really scary and took so much out of me um, to the point where like when I was flying home, I had a layover in the Denver airport and I stopped to have some lunch and thank goodness that there was a really kind waiter who came and said, okay, don't forget your debit card now. And your gate is this way because I, I was clearly not doing good. Um, but what saved me from that really dark place that I was in um, from that process was sisterhood um, and really close friends. And um, they saw that I was hurting and they offered to hold a healing ceremony for me. And that was just, um, it totally put me on a different path um, and was really grounding and helped me let go of some of that trauma that had been brought up that I didn't realize I was still carrying around. So I think as we think about what we can do um, to address violence against our women and girls and our two-spirit relatives is to start building those spaces of kinship um, and start building that support network. And I know it's hard to do under COVID and that's the other story I want to share is um, some of the things that I've experienced under COVID just seem healing. Um, so SBI, we have, um, we, we're doing some art therapy workshops for survivors and MMIW family members. We're doing some virtual support groups. Um, and it's been, I, I was just blown away. Last week, we had one of our first group meetings for survivors and family members who want to learn how to bead. And the, just the practice of sitting down with beads and learning something like that was such an open and inviting way to talk that people shared things that they've never shared anywhere else. Um, and it really was this beautiful safe space where people could share with each other. Um, and we did that over Zoom and it didn't cost any money. Um, so if you're thinking about something you can do in your community, creating circles like that, even virtually, um, really makes a big difference. Um, and, you know, the other thing I want to share is sometimes if we're, I know a lot of us being under social distancing stuff, um, the isolation can be hard and it can kind of lead us to isolate more. Um, I know that's been my reaction as a survivor um, is to just kind of like tuck myself away for a while. And that's okay if that's what your spirit needs. Um, but one of the things that I did the other night was really healing and I did it by myself. Um, and so, and it doesn't cost any money. You could do it today if you wanted to. Um, and it felt really silly at the time, but then as I was doing it, it was really healing. And what I did was, um, and I just had this like gut impulse to do it was I took like an eyeliner pencil, but I think you could do it with any kind of makeup or even like a washable marker, um, 
And I wrote, I thought of all of these negative words that people have either said about me or that I've thought about for myself. Um, and I wrote them all over my body. And I looked at myself in the mirror and it just hurt my heart so much. Like, why am I, why am I allowing um, these words to be carried on my body in this way? Um, it's not healthy, it's not good. And so I got in the shower and I scrubbed it all off and I had some medicine that was special to me and I used it to scrub it all off. And I felt so good afterwards and so much lighter. And that was my own little personal healing ceremony of one. Um, so for anybody who is thinking that they need something like that, um, I would definitely recommend it. It was uh, really easy to do and uh, really helped me kind of recenter and ground and let go of some of that negativity and that trauma that I was carrying around. That is totally awesome. Like, awesome. That is so, you know, uh, as you were speaking, I just wanted to, um, you know, I have um, a list of sexual attitudes because part of this healing with missing and murdered indigenous girls is around getting different attitudes. And so I'm just going to read some of the healthy sexual attitudes and it's a mindset um it just just for a moment so you could get a feeling of it um uh, versus um sexual um, abuse so healthy sexual attitude is sex is a controllable energy sex is a choice sex is a natural drive sex is is a nurturing and healing sex is an expression of love sex is sharing with someone sex is part of who i am sex requires communication sex is private sex is Sex, sex is honest, sex is mutual, sex is intimate, sex is responsible, sex has boundaries, sex is empowering. And I just wanted to say those things because those are the things that we're wishing for little girls, those are the things that we're wishing for teenage girls, native girls, and those are the things that we're wishing for adult women. And so I wanted to, um, Anita, in your, you've done a lot of work over this, this past couple of years visiting with survivors and how they start to heal themselves around their own um, sexual identity and their own well-being. Um, can, you, can you give us some of that history, Anita? Sure. Um, well, I think that for those of us who are survivors of sexual violence, it can create a really um, hard relationship to sex. And that can be different things for different people, whether it's um, not being able to be intimate in that way because your body is carrying that trauma um, or seeking it out too much as a way to feel some kind of numbing. Um, and that can be harmful as well. Um, you know, sex is a really beautiful way of create of connecting with somebody, um, but it should be done for that reason, not to numb out um, or not to um, escape from the world for a little bit. Uh, and a lot of the survivors that we work with are kind of in that place. I know, you know, myself personally as a survivor, I had to do years of therapy to kind of work through my own baggage around it. Um, even to the point where, um, like when Theta and I first met, I was really sick. Um, and it's because I was carrying around so much trauma from all of the things that I had experienced that it was making me sick. And um, I ended up, you know, doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I had all sorts of exams and um, they just could not figure out why I was in so much pain. I had horrible pain in my pelvis. Um, and they thought that I was going to need surgeries and that was traumatic and scary and they just couldn't figure it out. And finally they said, okay, just go see this pelvic floor physiotherapist. We don't know what else to do. Go see her. And it was life changing because she taught me how trauma manifests in our bodies um, and how, how it impacts our physical health and well-being. And so when I understood the science behind 
how our trauma is carried in our body and can create really intense physical pain or all sorts of other symptoms. Um, it helped give me the tools to figure out how to make it stop and how to work through that trauma and take better care of my body and to not do things that created more trauma and more physical issues. Um, so I think that's something to remember is that even if in our mind we feel like, oh, I'm good, today's a good day, I'm fine, I'm whatever, your body has a memory too. And even if your brain isn't triggered, your body can still be triggered. Um, and you can notice that in things like if you, if you have a headache or muscle cramps or um, if, you, if you're really stiff or sore or your back really hurts, those are some examples of things that can happen when we're just carrying too much trauma and we're not recognizing it and, and slowing down and saying, okay, what can I do to make my body feel better? Thank you. Thank you. I really like that, um, heal, that self-healing, that, um, you know, paying attention to what your, what your body is saying. So along those lines, and I'm, I'm, I'm a more tangible person, here's another book. <laughs> this book is, um, it's the ACOA Trauma Syndrome, and it also has a lot of the activities, um, like for me, you know, I'm, I'm a just like to um, continue that this healing and I'll, I'll name some of the things um, that I do is I really had to learn to trust again. I really had to trust my own feelings and I really had to find uh, people that I could talk with and just just feeling free to to say how I was like I felt abandoned I felt um, rejected. I felt unworthy. I needed to express those type of feelings that you get. And so I would recommend this, this book. And um, we'll, um, again, we'll, we'll put them on our, our Facebook sites. And, you know, Native Wellness Institute, um, we're, this entire week, you're just listening to this hour, but every hour, every day at um, noon um, Pacific Standard Time, we're doing some healing and some intervention on missing and murdered um, girls and women. So, you know, and you can go to um, um, our, our website. You can go to YouTube, Native Wellness Institute. You can go to our fr Facebook page. So, Anita, how do, we, how do we learn about Sovereign Bodies Institute? How do we get hold of you? What do we look at? Can you give us some of your sites? Because we're a sister... Um, a sisterhood, NWI and SBI have an alliance. So please tell us, how do we get hold of your stuff? Sure. Um, you could follow us on social media. We have a Facebook page, Sovereign Bodies Institute. We're also on Instagram as Sovereign Bodies and Twitter as Safe and Sovereign. Um, and then our website is sovereign-bodies.org. Um, and if you check out our website, we've got all sorts of resources. We did a really awesome webinar with um, our Survivors Leadership Council, which is all Indigenous people who are survivors of trafficking and sex work. Um, they did a really awesome webinar a couple weeks ago on uh, MMIW and trafficking under COVID. Um, that recording is there. Our toolkit will be there today as well. Um, so definitely take some time to check out the resources on our site and um, all of our contact information is there as well. That's excellent. That's excellent. Thank you, Anita. Um, okay, so uh, another book <laughs> is, um, this is from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. And Anita did, um, her first three years of research was a lot of the the, the data coming from Missing and Murdered in Canada. But this book right here, it, in a nutshell, this was 6,000 survivors of residential school were interviewed and what kind of trauma they went through. But the good part about this book is as they did the interviews, they also did the reconciliation activities that need to happen. The forgiveness ceremonies, the reaching, the having you know safe places for women, having safe places for Native men, and the reconciliation activities are also in here. 
the beauty of this this commission is they have 94 recommendations that are um, being funded and starting the implementation in Canada. So one of the things in Canada right now, and uh, we're just sharing because it seems to be working, is they're calling all, they're not calling their centers domestic violence. They're not necessarily calling them sexual assault, assault programs. They're calling them wellness centers. And same thing in Australia, they, they call them harmony houses. They take the girls, they take the women to harmony houses. It's so we want you to start to think about what you call things. Really, we're in, it, we're getting a. We get this reset button with um, the pandemic. Really, in your communities, look at what you're calling your activities and what your you know what your their sisterhood programs. You know, a lot of, uh, Anita, if you could t um, share with us some of like the sisterhood programs that you're seeing across either Canada or the United States, give us some successes, some stories where our sisterhood are really changing things. Can you tell us about some of those? Sure. Um, I think the example that immediately comes to mind is all of the amazing work that the UNN family has been doing. Um, I got connected through them, uh, to them through Agnes Woodward, who's a member of the Union family. She does beautiful ribbon skirts at Recreations, um, and her Auntie Laney was murdered in Calgary. And um, her, so Agnes's mom and her aunties, uh, Laney's sisters, they've done so much good work advocating for Laney and for um, all of the all of the MMIW, and they're one of the first. Um, their family has been involved in this movement since um, it first started over 30 years ago in Vancouver. So they've had leadership across Canada for a long time. And um, this, a couple months ago, they invited me to a gathering that they uh, did for all of the families of Saskatchewan. And it was so beautiful to see all of those families there. They all got ribbon skirts. They all got to share their stories um, and there was healing spaces for them and it was just beautiful. Um, and I know that they're now planning on, um, doing other gatherings in other provinces. And we've even talked about our dreams of doing an international gathering of families on both sides of the border. Um, they do really awesome work. And I think they're a really great example of the success of family leadership and survivor leadership. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for that. Um, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, this T-shirt that I have on right here. I wanted to talk about the, the success of the, the English family. Joey English was um, one of their daughters that was murdered and they only found her, um, her torso and her head. They didn't find the rest of her body some years back. And then they had another daughter that was also murdered. But I want to talk about their healing. This was the conference that they put on um, just just as COVID was starting. It was in February 28th in Brockett. And at this conference, one, the things that they had, I mean, it was amazing. Around, around the room, there was um, activities by which you could heal. I mean, they, they, were, um, they were making collages. They were having beadwork like some of this this beadwork right here this is this is the provost family they've been sally provost was murdered in 1980 so all of the the granddaughter and that family they bead these these women these um these red beads they they were there they were beading they were they were doing activities and talking story so the bottom line is what they were doing is telling their story and that's when you look at this board behind us you know some of the some of the women's names here um you know the ashley loring heavy winner that we all know selena not afraid but if you look at the fine print around this is a living board all of the smaller print like at the bottom little monica 
little Monica was seven years old that was murdered on the Blackfeet Reservation. We found that the stories, what happens is we need to bring safe places. So we need to create these safe places where women can, survivors can share their stories. And so Anita, I'm going to um, give you um, some, some, uh, some space here um, because I'd like you to, you know, so many people ask you questions. What do we need to do to bring more healing and to intervene and just to stop this, this, this way that our women are treated like commodities. Can you please tell us some of how that can happen? Sure. Although that's a pretty big question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I have all the answers. I wish I did. Um, I think we, sometimes the way I talk about this movement is that we kind of have to be time travelers because we have to go back and heal the things that have already happened, but we also have to look forward and try to prevent more things from happening. Um, so it's a constant kind of going back and forth. And I think, you know, in terms of looking backwards, we have so much to heal from, um, you know, Theta has mentioned residential schools, um, there's all sorts of stuff that contribute to this that's in our past, but even in our individual past and, and especially for the families and for survivors of violence, there are things that, um, that they need to heal and that they need to have support. Um, SBI, we do provide some direct services to MMIW families and um, they have so many acute needs, even if the case happened 30 years ago, they still have needs for support and for healing. Um, so it's on us as their relatives and as community members to start reaching out and seeing what we can do for them um, and what their needs and priorities are uh, in terms of moving forward. And then, you know, to toggle into thinking how we can think about the future and to end violence. This is a conversation that I've had with a couple people this week um, because we've been trying to kind of figure that out. We had... Um, an incident where um, we we know of someone, and I think every Native community is like this, we know of somebody who's an active uh, perpetrator, um, who's hurting people, and we don't have, um, you know, there's only so much we can do in terms of reporting or supporting the victims and things like that, and we are doing all of that, um, but we're seeing that this perpetrator is still being uplifted as a community leader, um, and as somebody who's getting a lot of support and we just felt so frustrated, like, what can we do? What can we do when people don't take it seriously and still believe these guys and support them? Um, and I think there's, you know, Theta had a really good teaching. We we're on the phone this morning and she said, some things you just have to accept. And that doesn't mean we accept that people are going around hurting people. And we don't, you know, we don't accept that as normal, but we accept what we're able to do in the moment and what we're able to do moving forward. Um, and so we don't always have, you know, we can't be judge, jury and executioner for everybody, um, but we can make spaces where victims know they'll be believed if they come to us and know that they'll be supported. And that's the best way that we can hope that perpetrators will be held accountable um, because survivor voices need to do that. So it's on us to create spaces to where the people that they've hurt feel like um, they have, that they can step into that leadership and that they'll be surrounded by prayers and love rather than questions or criticism. Mm. That was a beautiful answer. You're getting good at this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, let's, uh, so let's just talk some more successes. Um, you know, on several reservations, uh, we've been teaching um, young girls, um, you know, six years old, seven years old, self-defense and how to defend themselves. And with that, One of the things that we're learning is that it's about confidence building. And so, Anita, I kind of wanted to talk about confidence as medicine. Um, confidence and self-esteem is actually medicine that we can teach to young girls. And in your experience with the programs that you've been, 
how have they been teaching confidence and, and self-esteem to, to young Native girls? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think that's really important. And I think a piece of that, too, is like the right kind of confidence, because we've seen that a lot of our girls have this deep rage from being mistreated for so long. And it comes out in all sorts of ways. And so, um, you know, they may carry themselves like they're big, bad and tough. And that's a form of confidence, but it's not really a healthy form. Um, and so I think trying to reach out to our girls um, and, and our two-spirit youth as well um, to uh, to teach them a different kind of more um, cool, calm, collected confidence um, and being really strong in who they are as, as Indigenous girls and two-spirit people um, and as leaders in their community. So uh, we have a virtual support group that meets a one, once a week for teen girls and, and young women. Um, and that's been a good space. Um, we also just, uh, a lot of the youth that we work with are children of an MMIW. I think that's one of the things that get um, kind of lost in the discussion of MMIW is so many of them were moms and their kids have to live their lives without a mom and that never goes away. And when we talk about collecting data on MMIW, one of the things that gets lost is how many kids are living that life without their moms. Um, and so they're not learning, how, especially our girls, they don't have someone to look to to learn um, what it means to be a healthy, strong uh, Indigenous mom, because um, they may have mother figures with aunties or grandmas, um, but it's it's not the same. So um, we do work with um, some uh, teen girls who whose moms have been killed or have gone missing, and um, they just, like, they just need so much love and need to be wrapped around with people to call and check in um, and no somebody who's not going to judge them. Um, and uh, that's really what we try to provide. You know, they have my personal cell phone number. They can call me at 3 a.m. if they want to um, or if they need help, you know, buying clothes because they're on the street. We will do that. Um, we try to meet them where they're at. And I think that's really important for all of our youth. They um they struggle with so much and yet they have so much to contribute that I think the best thing we can do is meet them where they're at, give them the resources they need and continue to encourage them to uh, to be leaders in their community. So one of the ways we've done that is by encouraging the youth that feel ready to do it, um, to do interviews with the press or to speak at different events and share their stories so that they get confident and comfortable with speaking up and sharing um, and uh, using their voice as a power for good. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other protective factors I was thinking about is um, rites of passage. And one of the, I think, a protection that we can have for babies, young girls being born or, or you know, as toddlers is the first rite of passage is to get their Indian name, you know, and, and, um, and explain. So then... That's that's a rite of passage. But uh, Anita, I was also thinking that we need rites of passage of survivorhood, you know, and, and uh, every, you know, if, they, if they've gotten sober, if they've got off drugs, if they got their own house, if they got their own car. Yeah, I think what Theda was sharing is really important and um, definitely something that was important even in my own healing journey as a survivor, um, having um, having access to things like ceremony and, and um, you know, I didn't receive, I'll tell you the story of how I received my Indian name. Um, I, um, I didn't receive it till I was an adult and I had to go back to the city where my abuser lived and um, I was really scared and I had to do that in order to defend my thesis and get my master's degree. And I had a sister friend who said, well, what's your Indian name? I'll, I'll make sure to pray for you to make sure that you're safe. And I said, well, I don't have one. And she said, okay, well, I'm gonna make sure you get one. And that's how it happened. Um, it was part of you know, my community protecting me from the violence that I experienced and protecting me from experiencing more. Oh, that's beautiful. And I, I love your Indian name. And I, just, you know, I just love being um, like your older sister or, or your other mother. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> watching, watching, 
cool. Um, so another another protective factor or another thing that I'd like to speak about is um, learning to love yourself. Um, you know, we have an exercise, Native Wellness Institute, we have all these exercises. But one is where we actually ask everyone, you know, because we believe in, you know, 21 days. Like we're all learning new habits during this pandemic. But for 21 days to as soon as you can in the morning, Look in the mirror and no matter what you look like, you know, maybe you haven't brushed your teeth, your hair, hair is kind of shaggy or whatever, however, and that you just look at yourself and tell yourself, I love you. I And, and then, you know, like I know when I first started doing it, I just like sobbed <laughs> the first when I first started doing this exercise, just looking at myself and accepting myself for who I am. Yeah, I think that positive self-talk is so important. Um, And even like, you know, I'll share if there's any survivors on the call who are listening. um, Sometimes when we get really triggered, um, we kind of, the the technical word for it is dissociate. Sometimes our spirit leaves our body for a little bit um, because it feels safer to do that. And it's important to call your spirit back. Um, And you can do that in whatever place feels good to you. Um, but just say your name, um, call your spirit back, ask your spirit to come back to you and to your body. Um, and, uh, it, it does make a difference. And even if you feel like your spirit's not ready to come back, sometimes I feel that way when I'm just, I know that I'm going to be upset for a little while and I just need to process it and work through it. Um, it may sound silly, but I talk to myself. Um, I talk to myself and say, okay, come on, Anita, it's time to go do this. Um, and it, it works, um, and it helps me feel more tethered to whatever piece of my spirit is floating above me in the moment to say like, okay, if you're not ready to come back to me yet, that's okay, but I'm dragging you along with me. Um, <laughs> and we still hold on to those pieces of ourselves. Oh, I, I just love this. So maybe, um, we only got about, um, 10 more minutes to go, um, can can you just um, describe? I I know you've been listening to a lot of women, and you know I I listen to a lot of women. I'll tell a little story, but tell tell us of of how women um, get into healthier relationships. Um, I'll just start, and then um, I'd like you to to think about um, the women that you've been talking to. One of the things that that I've really seen is if women have. Um, old resentments are the against a man especially if they left them like left them pregnant or left them one of the things that i've seen women do and it's healing because if say that the child that they have from this man is a son and they i've seen them work on forgiveness because if they don't if they hold that resentment especially if that son looks like the man that left them you know if there's this constant reminder or there's there's so and and if they don't do their healing what they do is they just take that unresolved that toxic feeling and they put it into their sons and that's how the cycle is continued so one of the things that, um, you know, I've seen women do is they work on forgiveness and they work on themselves for the sake of their children, for the sake of the, the, their, their grandchildren. Um, and so and, and then they, they practice healthier relationships. You know, I was I was laughing. One of my friends, you know, they said they should ask them if they if they have a job, <laughs> if they have a car, <laughs> if they have their teeth. <laughs> I mean, you know, like just, I'm just, I mean, you know, I'm just some humor, but Anita, could you give us some examples in this remaining time that you've seen women come out of that desperation and find themselves and get into healthier relationships? Um, sure. Um, I think, you know, it's hard. So I'm 28. I turned 29 in two weeks. Um, And so most of my personal friends are around my age or a little bit older, and we're all still, you know, trying to find love. Um, But uh, I think 
the biggest thing is learning to let go of that old baggage, um, learning to trust and finding, um, finding the person who's willing to earn that trust. So the story that I can think of is actually my mom and my stepdad. Um, because, uh, my, my mom, uh, my parents went through a really hard divorce when I was a kid and my mom was really hurting from it. And, um, you know, it led to some trust issues and things like that. And, um, and I was nine years old at the time. And I thought, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know who my mom is going to find. And I just want her to be loved and to be happy. And she and my stepdad have been together now since I was 11. So years and years. And he's been so good to her and so patient. And even when she's anxious or sad, he's just patient and supportive to her. And it really showed me, like, not only was it healing for her to have somebody who was willing to earn her trust through consistently being supportive, um, but it also taught me as my, as my mom's daughter, and I think my other siblings too, that there's really good men out there who are willing to step in and, and be an extra dad, not just a husband, but an extra dad, and to earn people's trust and to be... Um, to be loving and kind and supportive. And my stepdad has been so supportive of me as a survivor and of SBI and um, has really just jumped right into it. So I think, you know, that's when I think of a success story of somebody hurt and then finding some really great love, that's who I think of. Oh, that's a perfect. Thank you for that story. We just want to remind everyone out there tomorrow, um, Jean Tagabon, and we have a bunch of Native men that are just going to come on tomorrow and they're going to really talk about women are women being sacred, about uh, protecting women. And we're Native Wellness Institute. That's why we have Anita today. You know, she's the best of the best. I mean, she's our younger generation that is going to continue the healthier relationships that is going to make a space for um, women to heal. But tomorrow we're going to have our men's healing. And with, so we'd li like to invite you with Gene Tagabon. Anita, could you, um, could you just share with us some of your thoughts on what native men could do to help in this situation with missing and murdered or can you just share your thoughts on that? Um, sure. Um, so SBI, our fiscal sponsor is seventh generation fund for indigenous peoples. And um, that's uh, being led by uh, TROs Peters and Chris Peters. And I want to share one of the things that Chris Peters told me when we first started SBI. Um, he said, uh, MMIW is a men's issue because men are primarily the perpetrators um, who are causing this violence and causing this crisis. And, uh, and said that really this is something that, um, that men should be stepping into uh, and to hold other men accountable and to teach other men how to be healthy, healthy men that don't hurt people. Um, and I think that's a really valuable teaching. And so I wanna encourage any men on the call, um, please do get involved. Please do um, encourage your brothers and your cousins and your friends to um, to have these conversations um, because it's really needed. And uh, you know, like I've actually had three different conversations with friends this week about there's all these good men in our communities who are really good-hearted, who treat women and children well, who um, are you know upstanding men men in the community that really contribute. Um, and a lot of them professionally do good work for the people, um, whether it's taking care of children who are in the system or advocating for women um, and talking about not abusing women. There's all sorts of men like that that don't get involved in the MMIW movement. And so our question has been like, how is it that we have these good men that are doing so many good things and then they don't take the extra step and get involved? Um, and I think, uh, uh, a friend of mine said, well, um, because they're good hearted, they don't want to get involved in the drama. They just want to be good men and do their own thing. And I think that's probably true. But now is the time to start getting involved. Uh, we need your voices. We need you to be part of this, too. Our circle isn't whole if you're not a part of it, too. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Anita. And, you know, I just want to give a shout out. You know, there's a lot of there's groups of fatherhood, a lot of men banding together who have significant sobriety. Um, I can think of Mike Duncan um, and the, the California group out, out, out near you, Anita. And then, you know, I think of, um, you know, other um, traditional men, you know, where we are, you know, that they always see women have always seen women as sacred to be nurtured and never to be abused. Um, Kit, is there some final comments? We just have a couple minutes left. Um, I just want to thank everybody. You know, we wanted this just to be a dialogue. And this is um, a victory for Anita and I because the toolkit is here. NWI is supporting SBI. And SBI is supporting NWI. And we just want to invite you all to come and, you know, join hands with us because it's going to be Indians supporting Indians and tribes supporting tribes. Anita, what what were you what would you like to give as your final comments in these last few minutes that we have? And I just want to say Kitsikakoman, I love you. But what would you like to say to our viewers out there? Um, well, I think what I would share, especially since today is May 5th and there's so many dialogues around MMAW, um, it can be easy to get bogged down in the grief and um and to feel like things are just hopeless or things are just um, so horrible, like you can just get paralyzed. And so what I want to encourage everybody today is to think about one thing that you can do as an individual, whether it's calling your policymaker or um, raising awareness by posting something on your social media, one thing that you can do today about MMIW. There's all sorts of small daily things we can do. And um, if you think about it from that way, it becomes a lot less paralyzing and overwhelming. And if we all do one thing every day, eventually this issue is going to go away entirely. Thank you, Anita. Um, everybody wear red. If you don't have your red on today, <laughs> just go and, you know, get something red and wear it out. You know, get get red for the whole family. Get for your children, for your grandparents. Everybody wear red today because red is a power color. Red is a healing color. And uh, I think that if we just put that energy out and put that energy out about respect and love for each other, that's what's going to heal us. So we thank you for listening. We thank you for bearing with our shape shifting. We thank you. We did um, try to comb our hair. We still got bushy eyebrows. <laughs> we got no nails, but so what? <laughs> So we want to thank all of you and thank you, Shailene, and thank you, Jalene, for always just having our back. And we love all of you. So we're signing off from Native Wellness Institute. Go to our Facebook page. Go to our YouTube page. Um, go to um, uh, SBI's. Uh, can you say SBI's link one more time, Anita? It's uh, sovereign-bodies.org. And we've got resources for families and survivors. So if you need help, reach out. Okay, with that, we're going to say see you later. Kitakito uh, Matsuno. So thank you very much. All right. Bye, guys. Love you, Theta. We love you. <laughs>